let's start this unit on online learning. Before we uh, dive into it, I want to kind of uh, connect the dots and show you where we are in the grand scheme of things. Uh, the previous unit was about linear models. And then we just talked about how good can a learning algorithm be? These are, these seem like two very different types of questions. This question of how good is a learning algorithm can be answered in many different ways. One approach for one way to answer that question uses the theoretical framework of online learning. And when online learning meets linear models, you get algorithms that are, uh, you get named algorithms. Uh, like for Cephron, there's an algorithm called Winnow, which we will not see, or the multiplicative weight update algorithm, which also we will not see. But uh, we'll go into quite a bit of detail about with Cephron. But this question can be answered in other ways as well. How would the learning algorithm, I can answer that using the PACT framework or uh, very, very related, the empirical risk minimization framework. When linear models meet the fact framework, we get a learning algorithm called support vector machines. But there are other ways to answer that question also, and we'll get to that later on in the semester. So for now, I'm going to talk about a specific case of online learning called mistake-driven learning. I'll introduce something called the mistake-bound model for analyzing learning. And then I'll show you a concept, uh, a proof of concept algorithm called Savi, which should never be implemented because it's really very inefficient. Um, but it's just a proof of concept that says that this mistake ball model is not describing an empty set. And then I'll apply the having the, the having algorithm and the associated theorem to concrete hypothesis functions, hypothesis spaces to see what the uh, uh, what kinds of functions are learnable and what kinds of functions are not learnable in a provable sense under the online model. And finally, I'll talk about the uh, end of the discussion about uh, uh, how changing representations can make learning much harder or much easier. Um, and in the context of uh, the broader thing, that's all about mistakes in learning. And then we'll talk about uh, uh, the Positron algorithm. I'll connect it to a general idea that pervades all of machine learning today, called uh, which is the gradient descent or the optimization uh, perspective for learning. And across all of these, you should be looking out for uh, the following issues. Representations are important. The way in which you represent in instances in the feature space can make or break learning. If you have the right features or the right feature transformation, learning can be trivial. If you do not have the right features, learning can be impossible. And unfortunately, we never know which world we, we are in. The complexity of learning is both the amount of information that's needed from the training data to the learner, and also the computational complexity. How much effort should the algorithm perform? And you also want to keep thinking about features because uh, in uh, application of your, your interest, different types of features might be relevant. And so different feature transformations and such things. We have five minutes and I'll briefly introduce the mechanics of the mistake bound model and we'll analyze it in the next lecture. Imagine there's a learning problem uh, that where the features, uh, where the feature space is extremely high. Imagine that we have a million features. And suppose the true function is extremely sparse in the space. We have a million features, but only five of them are relevant. X2, X3, X4, X5, X100, all in the uh, nearly million other features are irrelevant. But the learner doesn't know this. The learner gets examples that are million dimensions. The question is, can we build an algorithm that in an ideal world is independent of this true dimensionality and only depends on the, the number of relevant features? Turns out that's actually not, uh, we don't know how to do that, but at least it's not very strongly dependent on true dimensionality and only depends on the number of relevant features. What that means is can we build an algorithm whose success is not dependent very strongly on the fact that we have so many irrelevant features. The other question is uh, if we can build an algorithm of that type, how should the hypothesis uh, be represented, or alternatively, 
what should the hypothesis space be? Let me introduce a learning, a, a, a sort of a conceptual model for analyzing learning, which it turns out gives an answer to the first question. Uh, we, we won't cover the answer, but uh, I'll point you to the answer later on. The conceptual model is called mistake-driven learning. And it, it looks like this. There's a learner. At any point of time, the learner maintains the current hypothesis, H sub T. An example comes in, X. And this example is chosen by nature. The learner does not get to pick the example. The teacher does not get to pick the example. It's just cho chosen by nature. In fact, it could be chosen by an adversary, which means that that example might be chosen to be the most difficult example for the learner currently. And the learner makes a prediction using the current hypothesis. So the learner returns HT of X. After the learner produces the true, uh, its prediction, nature then reveals the true label. The true function is F. So nature, uh, we don't, we've not introduced F here. So na the nature, uh, the true label is revealed by nature to the learner. And at that point, the learner knows whether it has made a mistake or not. If it has made a mistake, then it updates its internal hypothesis from HT to HT plus one. And that's the end of this round. This round is over and the learner is now ready to face a new exam. This is, this is it. This is the entire mechanics of the learning algorithm. Of course, I've hidden two very important things here. I've not uh, described how the prediction part works and how the update part works, but by changing the prediction and update rules, we can basically invent different kinds of learners, different uh, hypothesis spaces and that way. It's such a simple scheme. And the question to think about is, can it actually learn interesting things? And if so, when can it learn interesting things? What does it mean for this model to be successful? I'll stop here. Um, let's pick up from here on Thursday. Don't forget the homework. I have office hours now if you have questions.